हेलो डियर स्टूडेंट्स दिस इज डॉक्टर अद्वैत एंड वेलकम टू लेक्चर नंबर सेवन ऑफ सेल द यूनिट ऑफ लाइफ एज ऑलवेज लेट्स हैव ए क्विक रिकैप ऑफ व्हाट वी हैव डन इन द प्रीवियस सिक्स लेक्चर्स नाउ बिफोर आई बिगिन विद द रिकैप लेट मी जस्ट क्विकली इन्फॉर्म यू दैट टुडे इट विल नॉट बी पॉसिबल टू हैव अ रिकैप ऑफ everything that i have done in the previous six lectures otherwise today's lecture will simply be too long so i am just going to mention the important points from the previous lectures that will be required today but other than that i will be unable to revise everything that i have done in the previous six lectures if you have any doubts regarding the previous six lectures please ensure that you have seen them before you start today's lecture which is lecture number 7 you already have the links for all the lectures or you can easily search for them on youtube so having said that let's have a quick actually quick recap of the previous six lectures in lecture number 1 we discussed about introduction to cell and i spoke to you about what exactly is a cell and what is the definition of a cell in lecture number 2 we spoke about the history of microscopy and we saw what is the cell theory as proposed by schleiden schwann and virchow in lecture number 3 we spoke about what are the parts of a cell protoplasm protoplasmic membrane cytoplasm nucleus cell wall we spoke about basic genetics where i explained to you about what exactly is a nucleus what is going to be chromosomes what are uh, what is dna what is genes what are alleles we also spoke about what were the characters or characteristics of a cell in this lecture i briefly also introduced you to the concept of prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells in lecture number 4 we spoke only about the nucleus in lecture number 5 we spoke about plastids and in lecture number 6 we spoke about the mitochondria so if you have missed any of this i would once again like to request you to go back to the respective lecture and see the lecture thoroughly before you begin today's lecture which is lecture number 7 right so as i said we started off with the eukaryotic cell and we first spoke about the nucleus in lecture number 4 and in lecture number 5 we spoke about the organelles the first one being plastid and the second one being the mitochondria and today we are going to of course continue from here but before that we need to have a quick recap of all the latin words we have done so far so we have seen bios is life logos is study of auto is self hetero is different trophos is to eat botan is plant zoon is animal micro is very small macro is small mega is big magnum is very big scopion is to see cyton is cell you have eu which means true pro which means early or primitive and karyon which means nucleus when we were speaking about plastids in lecture number 5 we also saw these words inter or meso means in between intra or endo means inside exo epi peri extra means outside exo or extra simply means outside epi means outside and above peri means outside and surrounding we then saw that phyla means leaf plastos means something that has been specially formed or created amylose is going to mean starchy or with carbohydrates elluro means wheat flour which is rich in proteins so elluro here in this case means with reference to proteins elion is going to mean oil especially olive oil so anything with reference to oil or fat can be called or prefixed with elion thulacos means pouch lumen means the cavity inside something or inside pouches lamella or lamina basically mean thin membranous sheets we also saw colors in latin or in greek so color is basically chroma color is called as chroma erythro is red leuco with a k is going to be white leutos with a t is going to be yellow chloros is going to be green and cyanos is going to be blue and then like i said as far as cell organelles is concerned we finished off plastids and we finished off mitochondria so today we are going to continue further so today's lecture starts now the first thing i want to discuss today is 
all of you already know that there is something called as nucleic acids nucleic acids are nothing but those acids which are found inside the nucleus everybody knows that they are of two types you are going to have dna and rna so both dna and rna have na na and na in both of them stands for nucleic acids so what is the difference between dna and rna if both of them are nucleic acids what does the d and r stands for so d stands for deoxyribo and the r in rna stands for ribo so you have deoxyribo nucleic acid and you have ribo nucleic acid dna deoxyribo nucleic acid and rna which is ribo nucleic acid so what is this deoxyribo and what is ribo so deoxyribo actually stems from the deoxyribose sugar that is found in dna so dna has a sugar called deoxyribose sugar it's a phi carbon sugar whereas rna contains a phi carbon sugar which is ribose so the main difference is in the name is because of the sugar found in the respective acid dna has deoxyribose sugar whereas rna has ribose sugar rna is further classified into three main types you have mrna trna and rrna for our purposes right now we don't need to focus on the first two at all so don't need to remember them as of right now what do you need to focus on right now that there is one type of rna out of three which is called rrna the r in rrna stands for ribosomal this will be important in today's lecture so just keep this in mind so what do i want you to know about nucleic acids as far as today's lecture is concerned the nucleus contains acid which are called as nucleic acids they are of two types they will either be deoxyribo nucleic acid or ribo nucleic acid dna rna dna is going to have deoxyribo sugar rna will have ribo sugar rna is of three types mrna trna and rrna for our discussion we just need to know that there is a type of rna called as rrna which has r which stands for ribosomal so rrna is ribosomal rna okay moving on let's say you are a go down owner somewhere in punjab and you have to store a lot of grains now to store all of these grains you are of course going to require some sort of bags or gunny bags let's say i was to come and offer you gunny bags like this one as you can see this is a gunny bag which is spherical i also give you a choice that you can have this spherical gunny bag here or you can have this one which is like the normal gunny bags which you must have seen so as a go down owner in punjab you have these two choices you have a spherical gunny bag and you have the normal flat gunny bags both of these gunny bags which i'm offering you are going to be having a volume of 25 liters and they can fill in about 25 kilos of grain so please understand that only the shape is different kitna weight un log mein reh sakta hai ya kitna volume unme bhar sakte hain is the same so there is no difference in kitna grain tum uske andar bhar sakta hai the only difference is shape so dear go down owner i am going to offer these two to you and i am also going to give you 25 lakh kilos of rice along with that i am giving you the option of either 1 lakh of these round ones or 1 lakh of those which are going to be the flat ones which one will you choose will you choose the spherical ones or will you choose the flat ones both of them will allow you to store the same quantity of grain 25 kilos or 25 liters by volume which one will you choose so your options are either you choose the spherical one or you choose the flat one which one will you choose and why given that both of them are going to have the same capacity to hold grain now if you are smart 
the one that you are going to choose is is all right all of you who chose that one which is going to be the flat ones are correct and the reason why those work better and if you thought about it is because you can stack them the flat gunny bags can be stacked one on top of another the advantage of stacking gunny bags one on top of the other is that in between the gunny bags there will be no space so aapke go down me jitni bhi jagah hai if you stack these gunny bags one on top of the other the ones which are flat you will save a lot of space the problem with the spherical bag even though the volume was the same is you cannot stack the spherical bags you cannot keep them one on top of the other they will simply not stay even if you find a way of making sure that they stay one on top of each other when you have one pile and next to it you have another pile there will be gaps in between so that much space will go waste while you are storing the grains so have a look at this diagram of an actual go down where the gunny bags are stored and you will notice that they are stacked in such a manner that literally there is no space being wasted very little space is present between the bags and you can stack them one on top of the other which you cannot do with spherical bags this concept will become clear when we see that what kind of bags are used inside the cell and with this you will understand that the cell can use both such kind of structures to store something spherical structures as well as flattened structures flattened structures will allow the cell to pack in more structures in the same small volume which is there inside the cell so that brings us to the next greek and latin words the first one being vesicle vesicle is the latin word for a sac so koi bhi portly koi bhi spherical bag jisme tum kuch bhar sakta hai will be called as a vesicle a flattened sac is called cisterne so what is cisterne if you have any kind of a bag which you have flattened so any kind of flattened bag can be called as cisterne so vesicle is a sac whereas a flat sac a flat chapta sac is going to be called cisterne small tubes are called as tubules so small pipes or small tubes can be called as tubules and finally you have reticulum which means network anything which repeats can be called as a network so you have we have telephone ka network vodafone ka network so what that basically means is that whenever there is going to be a tower and waves are going away from the tower they keep repeating themselves if you go to a classroom which you cannot go to right now but whichever classroom you must have gone in the past you would have noticed that there are benches laid one after the other so you can say that there is a network of benches inside your class so anything that gets repeated in the form of a repeated pattern can be called as network and network can also be called as reticulum so the four latin words that we have to know for today are you have vesicle which means sac cisterne which means flattened sacs you have tubules which are small pipes or small tubes and finally you are going to have the reticulum which means network so are these four words clear to everybody now fantastic so that brings us to this concept which is how do we separate parts of a cell meaning that if i have a cell how do i separate the nucleus the membrane the ribosomes the endoplasmic reticulum the mitochondria the lysosomes the golgi bodies whatever is there inside the cell how do i remove those things and separate them so the process by which this is done which i'm going to explain to you in the next 2 minutes is called as cell fractionation so what exactly is cell fractionation have a look at the definition given here it is the process used to separate cellular components while preserving individual functions of each component so in short the process by which 
सेल के अंदर के अलग अलग कंपोनेंट्स आप सेपरेट करेंगे और इस तरह से सेपरेट करेंगे कि हर एक का फंक्शन बरकरार रहेगा और आप उसे पढ़ पाएंगे सो द प्रोसेस बाय विच यू विल सेपरेट ऑल द इनर कंपोनेंट्स ऑफ अ सेल वाइल्ड एंश्योरिंग दैट यू आर स्टिल मेंटेनिंग द फंक्शन ऑफ दोज पार्ट्स दैट इज कॉल्ड सेल फ्रैक्शनेशन सो ऑफकोर्स द क्वेश्चन अराइज इज वाई डू वी नीड टू सेपरेट द पार्ट ऑफ अ सेल because only if you separate out the parts of a cell can you actually study the individual components and what they do so why is cell fractionation important individual cell parts can be isolated in sufficient quantities to carry additional study to determine their function so that is the main reason why you want to do cell fractionation so that you can remove the individual components of a cell and you can study what each one of them is going to do so for better study of a cell cell fractionation is important separating out the parts of a cell so how do you do it so cell fractionation is actually based on the principle which you can see on your screen right now as all of you know this structure is called as a merry go round you find it at majority of the parks gardens where children play and if you've ever been on this you know that as it starts to rotate you get this feeling of being pushed away as this wheel starts to rotate as this wheel starts to rotate you get a feeling that you are going to get pushed away and the faster it rotates the more force you will feel being applied on yourself to being pushed outwards has everybody experienced that so as it rotates there is a force being applied here and that force in physics is called as the centrifugal force is called as the centrifugal force and this is the force that is used to separate out the cell components and i will explain this to you in a minute but has everybody understood the principle underlying the process of cellular fractionation it is going to be this centrifugal force okay so how does this whole process work the first thing you need is a tissue sample meaning you need tissue which will have all the cells that you want to study so for example if you want to study the liver cell you will take a piece of the liver and this liver tissue will have all the liver cells which you want to study so you will take this tissue sample in a test tube and you will literally put it in a blender this whole tissue which is going to have some liquid you'll put it in a blender and you will literally let the blender work what this will do is literally break down all the cells and break the membrane of the cells even it may damage some of the cell organelles but all of them will not get damaged so most of the cell organelles will remain intact but the membranes the plasma membrane the cell membrane surrounding the cell is going to degenerate so once you have done this in the blender you remove whatever is in the blender into another test tube and what you have here now is called the homogenate because this process which you have just done is called homogenization so you have taken the cells the tissue and literally blended it all together to make it one homogeneous mass so what you get in this test tube will be called as the homogenate and the process is called as homogenization now what do you do after this you take the homogenate and you apply this principle to it centrifugal force so what do you do you actually take a centrifuge machine which looks somewhat like this and as you can see it is nothing but a test tube holder which is attached to a motor have a look at this diagram here it's nothing but a test tube holder with a motor attached to it so as the motor spins this test tubes which are attached will also spin and will be exposed to centrifugal force as you now know the better the motor the faster this will spin and the faster this will spin more and more centrifugal force will be applied so when you do that this homogenate this homogenate will actually look like this 
the centrifugal force will act more on the heavier particles which will settle down whereas the lighter particles in the homogenate will remain at the top. So what settles at the bottom is called as a pellet is called as a pellet and whatever remains up whatever liquid you see here remaining can be called as the supernatant. So you have the pellet and you have the supernatant. This process is called centrifugation. This process is called centrifugation. So first you do homogenization of the tissue or the cells you want to study and you get a homogenate and when you subject the homogenate to a centrifuge machine you are going to get the pellet. So the first step is homogenization. The second step is going to be called as centrifugation. This is what a centrifuge machine looks like. So an ordinary centrifuge machine looks somewhat like this. Okay, moving on. So once you have done the centrifugation, the pellet and the supernatant get separated out from the homogenate. Now, this centrifugation separates the particles by spinning them. Larger particles settle at the bottom and lighter ones are at the top. So you can understand that from this diagram. If you have a low spin or slower rotations, then you are going to have the heavier particles or the larger particles settle at the bottom, whereas the lighter ones remain at the top. But if you have a very, 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 very high speed or a very, very high rotations per minute, then even the lighter particles are going to start getting settling down. Even the lighter particles will start to settle down. So by varying the speed and the duration, by varying the speed and by varying the duration, are you going at a slow speed for little time or are you going for a slow speed for longer time or are you going for a faster spin for a short time or a faster spin for a long time? So based on all these combinations, you can separate out different sized particles present in the homogenate. Now, to apply more centrifugal force or to apply more force for the particles to settle, what will you require? you will require more spin. What will more spin require? Better motors, a better machine. What is that machine called? That machine is called as a ultra centrifuge. And that ultra centrifuge was discovered by this man. This man whose name was Theodor Swedberg. Now Theodor Swedberg was a Swedish chemist who won the Nobel Prize in 1926 for his discovery of the ultra centrifuge. So he was the man who made the ultra centrifuge. And when he made the ultra centrifuge, it looked somewhat like this. And you can see this big hole here. And in this hole, if you were to look inside, this is how it looks. So you can see that there are areas where you can place your test tubes, which has your homogenate, which will then be separated out by spinning it around and the particles inside the homogenate will separate depending upon what is going to be their particle size and density. So this ultra centrifuge can literally spin at a 130,000 RPM rotations or revolutions per minute. It can apply a force of more than 1 million times the force of the gravitational pull or the gravitational force. So I hope everybody now understands how this machine deserves the ultra in its name. So the man who invented this machine is called as Theodor Swedberg. In his memory, we also have something called as the Swedberg units. So what are the Swedberg units? Swedberg units basically measure how fast a particle of a given size and shape settles to the bottom of a solution. So Swedberg units tell you that when you take some particle in a solution and you spin it in the centrifuge, how fast or how slow is the particle going to settle? According to that, it is given a number and that number is called Swedberg units. So in short, Swedberg units will tell you roughly approximately the rate at which a particle will settle down the rate at which a particle in the homogenate will settle down. 
that is what Swedberg units will tell you, the rate. They are also called as the sedimentation coefficient and are denoted by the alphabet S. A particle's mass density shape will determine its S value. So how fast is something going to settle in the homogenate depends upon how big it is, how heavy it is and what is going to be its density. All these things, the size, the shape, the density, the mass will affect how fast the rate at which it will settle down. Of course, you can understand that if a particle is heavier with more compact shape, heavy with more compact shape, its Swedberg value will be greater than lighter particles with a less compact shape. So let me explain this to you with a little example. Let's take a cotton wool ball as you can see here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the same ball and I'm just going to squish it and that is the next ball that you're going to see. So now you can see two balls here. The first one is simply fluffy and the second one is going to be squished. The same, the same ball is just going to be squished and that's what I've shown on the other side. So if I was to ask you about the mass of each of them, would you agree that it is equal because it was basically the same structure that one is only squished. What it means is that if that one, the other one, the second one on that side, if it is squished, as far as density is concerned, it is going to be more dense as compared to this one. That one is going to be more dense as compared to this one. So when I talk about the smaller one there, it is going to have a higher S, a higher Swedberg unit number, a higher sedimentation coefficient. Why? Because the rate at which it will settle down will be much faster than this one. So this one will have a lower S. So depending upon whether it is fluffy, less dense or it is compact and more dense, the Swedberg units will change. So if this is clear with everybody, let's continue with our process of cell fractionation. The first thing in cell fractionation is going to be homogenization. That is followed by centrifugation and once you take the homogenate and you use the process of centrifugation with a centrifuge machine, we get this solution which has a supernatant and a pellet. So we got this solution after having used a centrifuge at about 1000 G, 1000 times the acceleration due to gravity or the gravitational force. So we used the machine for 10 minutes at 1000 G and this is what we got from our tissue homogenate. So as you can see, there is going to be a supernatant and there will also be a pellet. Now this pellet is rich in all the nuclear material. So all the heavy molecules, the big molecules of DNA and RNA are going to be here and they have settled down at the bottom because of their large size. Now what do we do? We take the supernatant into another tube and we use the centrifuge machine again but this time at 20,000 G for 20 minutes. So faster and for longer. This is the solution we get now. So we had already removed the pellet rich in nuclear material and now this was put through the centrifuge to get this. Again we get a supernatant and we get a pellet but this time the pellet will be rich in mitochondria and chloroplast which are going to be the big cell organelles. So now the pellet is rich in mitochondria and chloroplast. Again we take the supernatant and we centrifuge it but this time at an even higher G value and for a longer period of time. So now we are at 80,000 G for 60 minutes almost an hour and this is what we get. Again, we have a supernatant and we have a pellet. But this time, the pellet is going to have all the membranes. So all the membranes that were destroyed, the cell membrane, maybe the mitochondrial membrane, the cytoplasmic membrane, all these membranes are now going to settle down. So this pellet is rich in pieces of membranes. Again, we take the supernatant and we put it in the ultra centrifuge. This time, we will use a extremely high rotational value which is going to be about 
150,000 g, 1 lakh 50,000 g, 1 lakh 50,000 times the gravitational pull and we will do it for 3 hours. Because of this, whatever little particles are left here will also settle down. Detonatant along with a pellet rich in very small organelles called ribosomes. So this, dear students, is how you separate out the various components of the cell. This is called cell fractionation. The first step is homogenization and the second step is called centrifugation or differential centrifugation. I think it should be clear from the diagram as to why it is called differential centrifugation because you are doing the centrifugation at different g values and for different longer durations of time. So I hope this entire process of cell fractionation is extremely clear to you. So as you can see at the very end you get pellet which is rich in ribosomes which brings us to our first organelle for the day, ribosomes. So ribosomes are basically the cell organelles which are going to do the function of producing proteins. So the organelles inside a cell responsible for protein synthesis are ribosomes. Ribosomes were first seen by this man whose name is George Palade and George Palade saw them in 1953. As you saw in the previous slide, the ribosomes are extremely, extremely small. They have very, very light weight. They are of very small size and that is why in differential centrifugation, you have to centrifuge them at a very high G value and for a very, very long time. So they're very small. That is why they were not seen before electron microscope was discovered or was invented somewhere in the 1930s. So the electron microscopes, the designs of the electron microscopes were developed and improved upon somewhere in 1938-1940, around that time. George Palade was George Palade was one of the men who was at the forefront of using the electron microscope. So he was the first one to see these structures inside the cell and he called them as ribosomes. So ribosomes are the granular structures first observed under the electron microscope as dense particles by George Palade. So this was in the year 1953. This is what ribosomes look like. So ribosomes are composed of ribonucleic acid, RNA and proteins. And this is why in the very beginning of today's lecture, I explained to you that RNA is of three types and today we need to know the third type of RNA which is rRNA, ribosomal RNA. So this whole structure that you see here is made up of ribosomal RNA. Of course along with that there are going to be other proteins as well. So ribosomes are composed of ribonucleic acid, RNA and proteins. They are not surrounded by any membrane. So I know that here it appears that they have a membrane but please remember that ribosomes are without any membrane. Nucleolus is without any membrane. Nucleus, chloroplast and mitochondria all these three are with two membranes. So just keep these things in mind. So ribosomes are not with any membrane. They do not have any membrane. Ribosomes have two subunits, the larger and smaller subunit. So have a look at the diagram here and see what happens now. So you can see that I have separated them and there is a larger subunit at the top and there is a smaller subunit down. So this bluish thing is bluish purplish thing is the larger subunit whereas this is the smaller subunit. So all ribosomes are made up of two subunits, a larger subunit and a smaller subunit. Now the larger subunit, the larger subunit has 60 S or 60 Swedberg units of sedimentation coefficient. I hope that this number now is clear to you that what is the meaning of 60 S. The smaller sub unit is going to have a sedimentation coefficient of around 40 S. 
So you have 60s, you have 40s. And if I was to put the two of them together to form the ribosome, to form the eukaryotic ribosome, the ribosome found in the eukaryotic cell, majority of you would think that it would be about 100s. So you would believe that this structure here should have a sedimentation coefficient of about 100s. But if you were paying attention when I was explaining Swedberg units to you, you would know that how fast or the rate of sedimentation is going to be depending on not only the mass or the size, but also the shape and the density. So as these two structures, the larger subunit and the smaller subunit, as they come together and form this eukaryotic ribosome, the important thing to understand is that the molecule becomes slightly bigger in size. It will have a slightly different shape. So its sedimentation coefficient, its Swedberg units are going to be lesser as compared to 100s. The rate at which it will sediment will not be the same. It will undergo its sedimentation at a slightly lower or slower rate. So in this case, it is going to be 80s. So once the larger and smaller subunit come together, their rate of sedimentation or the sedimentation coefficient becomes 80s. So eukaryotic ribosomes are 80s ribosomes. I hope this is extremely clear to you now. Okay, with that, let's also talk about prokaryotic ribosomes. So here again, we have a larger subunit, but in prokaryotes, it has a sedimentation coefficient of around 50s. Similarly, here is a smaller subunit and it has a rate of sedimentation or sedimentation coefficient of around 30s. Again, when they join together, they will form a prokaryotic ribosome. And you might once again think that let's add 50 and 30 to get 80s. But again, in reality, because of the changes in the shape and the density, it is going to sediment at a much slower rate. So its rate of sedimentation or its sedimentation coefficient is going to be 70s. So eukaryotic ribosomes are 80s, prokaryotic ribosomes are 70s. Are you clear as to why this is the case? Are you sure? Excellent. So let's quickly see what NCRT says about ribosomes. Ribosomes are the granular structures first observed under the electron microscope as dense particles by George Palade in 1953. They are composed of ribonucleic acid. Which type of ribonucleic acid? The R type. So there are three types. It is, it is composed of the R type and proteins and are not surrounded by any membrane. The eukaryotic ribosomes are 80s while the prokaryotic ribosomes are 70s. Each ribosome has two subunits, larger and smaller. The two subunits of the 80s ribosomes, the eukaryotic ribosomes are 60s and 40s. So 60 plus 40 is not 100, it is 80. At the same time, the prokaryotic ribosome is 70s and its subunits are the larger one being 50s and the smaller one being 30s. So again, 50 and 30 is not equal to 80, it is 70s. So eukaryotic ribosomes are 80s and prokaryotic ribosomes are 70s. Your S Swedberg's unit stands for sedimentation coefficient. It is indirectly a measure of density and size, which we have already discussed in detail before. And lastly, both 70s and 80s ribosomes are composed of two subunits as we saw two minutes back. So our ribosomes now extremely clear to everybody. What is the main function of ribosomes? Protein synthesis. That is their job, protein synthesis. Okay, so if all of this is clear, we can move on to the next cell organelle that we have to do today, which is endoplasmic reticulum. Now, even before we start with this, the name itself should tell you what this is. What is the meaning of the word endo? Endo means inside. The word plasmic here comes from cytoplasm and the word reticulum means network. So some network which is within the cytoplasm will be called as endoplasmic reticulum. Here you can see that there is a plant cell and a animal cell. 
both of these cells, both of these eukaryotic cells are completely packed with the cell organelles. But you can see that there are a few repeating units that you can see here and here which form this network inside the cytoplasm. Can you see that? That dear students is endoplasmic reticulum. So as always let's take an animal cell and let's magnify the endoplasmic reticulum. So here the first thing you notice is that this is the double membrane of the nuclear envelope which we had discussed in lecture number 4 here. So you can see that these structures here are the nuclear pore. This is the outer nuclear membrane. This is the inner nuclear membrane with this space of about 10 to 15 nanometers which is called as the perinuclear space. So you can see that this is the double membrane of the nuclear envelope. Now outside that you notice these structures here. 1, 2, 3, 4, so on and so forth. And notice that all of these are nothing but flat sacs. They are nothing but gunny bags lined one after the other. Can you see that? And what is going to be the function of these gunny bags? Basically to store something. So if you want to store something inside the cell in these structures, it is better to have them absolutely flat so you can stack them so that no space is wasted within the cell. So here, these structures, these flattened sacs, as you know, are called cisternae. From the cisternae, you can see that these little, little pouches are getting off and these tiny little spheres can be called as vesicles. Connecting all of this together are these various tube-like structures which will be called as tubules. So within the cell, you now have this reticulum, this network of repeating units of cisternae, vesicles and tubules. That, dear students, is called as endoplasmic reticulum. Have you understood now what is endoplasmic reticulum? Endo meaning inside, plasmic comes from cytoplasm and reticulum means network. So endoplasmic reticulum means nothing but the network of cisternae, vesicles and tubules within the cytoplasm. The network of cisternae, vesicles and tubules within the cytoplasm. What are cisternae? Flattened sacs. What are vesicles? Sac-like structures and tubules are small pipes or small tubes connecting all of this together. So endoplasmic reticulum comprises of cisternae, vesicles and tubules. Also notice how all of these are connected to each other by tubes and they are connected to the nucleus. Can you see that? So I can say that the endoplasmic reticulum is continuous with the outer nuclear membrane. So you have the nuclear envelope, it has an inner membrane and an outer membrane and the outer membrane is in contact with the cisternae vesicles and tubules. So this outer membrane is going to be connected with the endoplasmic reticulum, with the cisternae vesicles and tubules. So that dear students is endoplasmic reticulum which is extensive and is continuous with the outer membrane of the nucleus. Now please focus on the cisternae in this diagram and you will notice that this is the lumen of this particular cisternae. Can you see here? Can you see here? This entire structure is the lumen of this particular cisternae. Similarly, each cisternae here has a lumen. What this means is that the entire cytoplasm, this whole area here, this whole area, Baba, this whole area here, 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 this whole area which is outside the nucleus, which is outside the nucleus, which is called cytoplasm now can be classified into two compartments. Whatever is found within the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum will be called as the luminal compartment and whatever is outside will be called as extra luminal compartment can also be called as the cytoplasmic compartment. So there is a nuclear envelope Outside it, there are going to be many, 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 many sac-like structures, flattened sacs or sac-like structures called vesicle and cisternae. They are connected by little tubules. The cavity inside this will be called as lumen. Whatever is inside can be called as the luminal compartment and whatever is outside can be called as the cytoplasmic compartment or extra luminal compartment. So we can say that the endoplasmic reticulum divides the cytoplasm 
or the part of the cytoplasm the cytoplasmic part of a cell into two main compartments there is going to be the luminal compartment and the extra luminal compartment or the cytoplasmic compartment finally with regards to the endoplasmic reticulum here you can see that this entire part is associated with these golden dots and these cisternae which are associated with these golden dots these golden dots are actually ribosomes so this when you see under the microscope appears to have a rough appearance and is called as the rough endoplasmic reticulum it is called as the rough endoplasmic reticulum why is it called like that because under the microscope it will appear rough because it has these ribosomes sticking to the cisternae so now you can understand what will be the function of these cisternae what is the function of the ribosome the function of the ribosome is to make proteins so whatever proteins these ribosomes these ribosomes are going to make where do you think those proteins are going to be put they will be put here in the lumen so the luminal compartment of these cisternae will be filled with proteins so rough endoplasmic reticulum stores proteins in its luminal compartment is this statement clear to everybody great also you will notice that here there are cisternae which have no ribosomes so in the electron microscope they are going to appear absolutely smooth so what will they be called they will be called as smooth endoplasmic reticulum again smooth endoplasmic reticulum also has cisternae or bags flat bags flattened sacs what will be the function of them the same thing you want to put something inside so here usually lipids are going to be stored so the rough endoplasmic reticulum which has ribosomes associated with it will store the proteins made by the ribosomes whereas here the smooth endoplasmic reticulum in its lumen is going to store mostly lipids or fats is this clear to everybody excellent so finally how does this look under the electron microscope how does this the illustrated picture of endoplasmic reticulum how does it look under the microscope so it looks somewhat like this these structures here are the cisternae these structures here are the cisternae and what you see here what you see here are the ribosomes so this whole area here is actually rough endoplasmic reticulum what you see here are the vesicles and you can see that there are no ribosomes surrounding this area so this here can represent the smooth endoplasmic reticulum so this is how it looks under the electron microscope which brings us to what is written in the ncrt about endoplasmic reticulum electron microscope studies of eukaryotic cells reveal the presence of a network or reticulum of tiny tubular structures scattered in the cytoplasm that is called as the endoplasmic reticulum found only in the eukaryotic cells they are extensive and continuous with the outer membrane of the nucleus hence endoplasmic reticulum divides the intracellular space the space inside the cell into two distinct compartments the luminal compartment which is inside the endoplasmic reticulum and the extra luminal compartment which is the cytoplasmic compartment the endoplasmic reticulum often shows ribosomes attached to their outer surface the endoplasmic reticulum bearing the ribosomes on their surface is called rough endoplasmic reticulum and its short form is RER which is given in the textbook and can also be asked to you in the same short form manner in the exam so RER is rough endoplasmic reticulum at the same time in the absence of ribosomes they appear smooth and are called smooth endoplasmic reticulum so that is SER so er endoplasmic reticulum can be rer rough endoplasmic reticulum or it can be ser which is smooth endoplasmic reticulum finally rer is frequently observed in the cells actively involved in protein synthesis and secretion because rer rough endoplasmic reticulum is associated with ribosomes and ribosomes are the cell organelles which are going to be producing the proteins which are stored in the rough endoplasmic reticulum now one other point i wish to mention here is that ribosomes can be freely floating in the cytoplasm or they can be attached to the endoplasmic reticulum so only when ribosomes are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum is the endoplasmic reticulum called as rer 
but it is not necessary that ribosomes will always be attached to the endoplasmic reticulum. Ribosomes may be attached, ribosomes may not be attached. When they are attached, then it is called as the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And finally, the SCR, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, is the major site for synthesis of lipids. So, this is what the NCRT, this is what the NCRT had to say about endoplasmic reticulum. And with that, we finish off today's topics that we needed to discuss ribosomes and endoplasmic reticulum. And that, dear students, concludes today's lecture. I hope you have understood everything that we have discussed today and I cannot wait to see your smiling faces in the next lecture. Thank you. God bless. Work hard. Be nice.